Hello and welcome to Game Tech. This time around we're taking a look at the Sega Master System and I am excited to talk about this one. I am not as excited as you are because it's not a Nintendo system, but let's take a look. Give us a lowdown, Joe. I want to hear about it. Okay, let's, convince me. let's take a look at the system itself. The Sega Master System. Originally known as the Sega Mark III in Japan, it was redesigned and released in the US in late 1986 and in the UK in 1987. At the time, we simply called it the Sega System over here. It was the system designed to compete with the mighty Nintendo Entertainment System. The Master System is renowned for its box art, which is basically clip art. I mean, how can you not love it? The hardware was fairly impressive for the time. It used a Z80 processor, or Z80 if you're abroad, running at the same clock speed as the future Super Nintendo would. And it even had a few more colors than its main rival. Perhaps the system's biggest flaw was putting the pause button on the console as opposed to the controller. Speaking of the controller, it's very similar to the one on the NES, except it doesn't have a start button or a select button, and the D-pad is kind of... squishy. The games themselves came on small cartridges and even smaller credit card sized cards, but generally they stored more data than Nintendo games. It also had a sleek light phaser, a trackball called the sports pad, and some nifty 3D glasses. Heck, it even had a built-in game called Snail Maze. In Japan, an external module enabling FM sound capabilities could be added to the Mark III and was even built into Japan's version of the Master System once the redesigned unit was released over there. Unfortunately, nobody outside of Japan ever got FM sound capabilities, but it can be added to non-Japanese systems today with an attachable board and a bit of soldering. Many US and UK releases still have the FM sound built into them. Some of these games were never even released in Japan. In this episode, we'll be listening to the FM sound of any games we show if it's available. Sega eventually released a cheaper version of this system which was no longer compatible with the card games or the 3D glasses. Overall, the Master System was a really cool little system with tons of potential. But despite all this, Sega wasn't even able to make a dent in the Nintendo juggernaut. Only 114 games came out for this system in the US, with around 318 total releases in all regions. It was, however, extremely popular in Europe and Brazil, maybe even more so than the NES. Thanks to this, the Master System sold between 10 and 13 million units worldwide. All right, Joe. Well, I'm a bit more convinced that this system has something going for it. Yeah, you know, yeah. and now I'm going to need to look at some of the games. To, yeah, know. it was my first system that I ever bought, and it, well, you it, you must have liked it. I did, man. It was great. It, it introduced me into the world of video games. I mean, I played the Atari before that, but yeah, this but was, was my my game. own first system yeah. that I bought with my own money. Right. So, well, let's take a look at some of the games because we all know games are make up the most important part of the system. Yeah, let's do it. One of the first games I purchased the same day I bought my Master System was Space Harrier. I was really excited. It was a port of a cool arcade game, it had twice the mega power, and it was definitely going to be fun. And it was. They did change the graphics around, everything seemed bigger than it was in the arcade. But it was fairly accurate for the time, and learning this game allowed me to easily beat the arcade version as the enemy patterns were the same. I also fell in love with the music to this game, and I still love the music today. This is also the first game that I had beaten, ever. I remember feeling so accomplished when I did it. There were some strange credits in this one. Yeah. Oh, and even Colonel Gaddafi contributed to this game. This is still one of my favorite games on the system. Unfortunately, Space Harrier 3D didn't fare quite as well. I was super excited when this came out, but it was twice as slow and twice as choppy. And about five times as hard. I've still never beaten it. The other game I bought the day I purchased the system was Choplifter. I absolutely love this game. For some reason, the thought of flying my helicopter, picking people up, and transporting them back to the base really clicked with me. I did like Defender on the 2600, so maybe that's just one of my weird idiosyncrasies. 
Anyway, this is my favorite version of the game. Even the sequel games on more powerful systems don't control anywhere near as well as this one does. You start out each stage with two lives in reserve. Extra lives do not carry over. If you make it to the next stage, you start out with three lives total, period. You need to rescue at least 40 hostages out of a total of 64 to clear the stage. But if you get shot down, all the hostages on board will die. You can also kill hostages by shooting them, landing on them, or even chopping them to bits with your blades by blocking the exit from the building they're in. If 25 or more hostages die, it's game over. The scrolling in this one is really nice and it provides a great sense of depth. It's actually because of this game that I started noticing parallax effects in real life and now I'm obsessed with such things. Yeah, I'm weird, who cares. This game even has Superman and E.T. in it. Just make sure you own this game if you have this system. Deep Duck Trouble, starring Donald Duck, was released in 1993. Naturally, this game was only released in Europe and South America. The USA only got it on the Game Gear and not the Master System. It's a shame, too, because this is a great platformer. This game is extremely colorful and the backgrounds are just great. I really like the small details in this game, too. For example, Donald sweats in the volcano stage and shivers in the ice stage. Donald controls well for the most part. I did have a few problems jumping at certain points in the game, but it wasn't a huge deal. Those hot peppers are back from Quackshot, and when Donald eats just one, he becomes invincible and moves very quickly in one direction. I like these peppers, but they're placed in some rather useless spots. There is only one actual boss battle in the game. On every level, except for the last, you're running from something, and if you make it far enough, you win the stage. This is a great addition to your Master System library and really shows off the graphical capabilities the system had. Golden Axe came to the Master System pretty much the same time it appeared on the Genesis. It's really choppy and you can only choose Axe Battler as your character, at least I think that's his name. You can choose between the different magics though. Anyway, the most notable thing about the game is that there's no sprite flicker anywhere. But that's because the game doesn't actually use sprites, it's all the background tiles being animated. However, the best Golden Axe game for the system is actually Golden Axe Warrior. This is a straight up Zelda clone through and through. As far as 8-bit games go, I think this one definitely one-ups Zelda. The graphics are nicer, the game seems more snappy, and the controls much better. Okay, okay, the music certainly isn't as epic, though. Anyway, Death Adder is back, and he even killed your parents. So now you're on a quest for vengeance, and if you can restore peace while you're at it, that's cool. Pretty much everything in here is taken straight from Zelda. The overworld, the dungeons, the overall progression of the game. It's really fun to play. However, right next to this game on my shelf is Golvelius. This game is also a Zelda clone of sorts. In fact, I think I might actually prefer this over Golden Axe Warrior. This one doesn't just stick to the normal overhead views though. The dungeons are actually side-scrolling levels or even sometimes force-scrolling overhead levels. Now while this adds a lot of variety to the game, it does remove the aspect of finding keys or switches in the boss dungeons. Still though, it's great fun and it has a lot of its own charm. And of course, it's full of that old English style text that Sega of America loved so much. I really like the music in this one. However, this is one of the few games where I'm not sure if I like the FM track better or the normal PSG track. I think the PSG track definitely has some of the better sound effects. But either way, I find that this game is really enjoyable. We've talked about the original Fantasy Zone before, and you should all know by now that it's a game that I love. The Master System version never really blew me away compared to the other versions, but Fantasy Zone 2 upholds the good name of the series and doesn't disappoint. Like the first game, you need to destroy enemy bases on a side-scrolling level that loops over and over. The levels are smaller this time around, but new to this version are Warp Zones. Blue Warp Zones will take you to a different area in the same stage. Kill all the enemy bases, use the money you've gained in the shop to upgrade your ship, and then enter the Red Warp Zone to fight the boss. As you can see, the game could not be any more colorful than it is. Everything from the backgrounds to the enemies look great. 
I like how the different areas in each stage all have their own unique backgrounds too. As with the other games, the enemies move in unsuspecting ways and it takes a while to actually learn their patterns. Controlling your ship is sluggish at first until you buy speed power-ups, but once you die, the power-up is gone and you have to buy it again. The music is great, but it's a bit too whimsical to listen to outside the game. It's truly a good sequel to a great game. Fantasy Zone The Maze takes the series in a different direction, and it's not the right direction. This time around, you play in a Pac-Man style game where you control Opa Opa collecting coins to buy power-ups and shoot down enemies who are in your path. You do this over and over on different mazes that aren't even very fun to look at. The music is still enjoyable in this game, and sadly, that's the only thing that will keep you playing as the game itself gets dull very quickly. I wouldn't really recommend this game to anyone. Galaxy Force is a pixel-perfect translation of the smash hit arcade game with 4 mega power. In fact, I doubt you could tell the difference if you put this version and the arcade version side by side. Uh, yeah, anyway, moving on, you're supposedly saving the Junos Galaxy from the evil 4th Empire, but that's not the way it looks to me. Instead, you begin by choosing a planet to invade. You fly around shooting everything you see and you ward off the defensive efforts of the local civilians. Then you fly through a tunnel leading to the planet core. Make it through and then BOOM! You've just destroyed the planet. Yeah, I honestly believe that you're the bad guy in this game. Not that I really have any problem with that. Anyway, the music is good, but not really memorable. And the graphics will kill you. I'm not kidding, it actually says that right on the box. I don't know, I think that's false advertising if you ask me. I'm still alive, maybe I should sue. Though I do feel like I died a little on the inside after playing this game, so maybe not. Still, it's interesting that Sega made this game, but left it to Activision to actually publish. Did you turn the camera on? She did. Would you turn it? We're not ready yet. Yeah. I mean, we're still talking about games. Yeah, back to games. Yeah, games. Wanted is one of the many great light phaser games for the Master System. I've got to admit, when it comes to the gun games, Sega easily beats Nintendo. And that saddens me deep inside. Take Wanted, for example. This is a third person light phaser game that takes place in the Old West. Every level is just full of awesomeness that pulls you in and you won't want to stop playing. Great colors and animation with lots of destructible set pieces. I like being able to shoot random things in the background, like the bottles and paintings in Mary's Saloon. Sorry, Mary, I'll pay for that later, but I am getting rid of this bad guy, so <laughs> actually you owe me. Not forgetting to mention the accuracy of the light phaser, and you're going to need it, as this game is not easy. I think the main reason it's not easy is because the clothing store in this game only sells one cowboy outfit. Everyone is dressed exactly alike, and you have to wait a quick second to see if they're friendly before you kill them. If you hit an innocent person, then you lose a chunk of your life bar. This isn't good, because at the end of most levels is a boss that takes nine shots to kill. You'll need all of the life you can get because as you're battling the boss, you still need to kill other villains that pop up on screen. Set in between the stages are bonus rounds, which you can shoot bottles or coins to try to up your score. What a great game. I had a lot of fun with this one. Let's not forget Wonder Boy. We have an episode comparing this series to Adventure Island, but you need these games if you have a Master System. The first game here is pretty good, I guess. But when Wonder Boy and Monster Land came along is when they really started getting good. Now the game has a far more adventurous theme and you need to upgrade your weapons and collect other items to help you. This game really gripped me in at the time, it's, it's really engrossing. But even better is Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap. Picking up right where Monster Land left off, this is probably the best Wonder Boy game, period. It has fantastic music and each animal you change into has different abilities to help you get further in your quest. This is absolutely a must have game and one of the best on the system. There's also Wonder Boy and Monster World, which is the fourth game in the series. 
It's good, but the Master System version is a bit neutered in content compared to the Genesis version of the same game. Kung Fu Kid is a great game that is loaded with enemies in action. Weird enemies too. What are those little bouncing guys that are in every stage? It controls really well with superhuman floating jumps. The game isn't that tough, but it's still fun to play once you learn the game's patterns. The music is good, thankfully, since it seems to repeat in every stage. Oh wait, it's different in this stage. Amazing! But really, it's a good game that most people never talk about. There's even a port of Ghouls and Ghosts for the system. It's not a straight up port though. Now there are shops where you can obtain upgrades to your equipment. Better armor to take more hits, boots to run faster and jump further, and stuff like that. The graphics have taken quite a hit and the game runs really slow, but it's an interesting port nonetheless. It's pretty damn hard too. Cloudmaster is a fun shooter released in 1989. You play as Mike Chen, who is a hermit studying to be the Cloudmaster. Evil forces, like these devil turtles, are trying to stop you from reaching your goal. Oh my god, they're pure evil. This is a very colorful game with well-drawn backgrounds, characters, and enemy sprites. Your character sprite is fairly large, so avoiding enemy shots can be kind of tough at times, especially before your character gains speed. Each stage has a mid-boss and an end-boss. Once you kill the mid-boss, a door opens up which lets you choose one secondary item. This can be a shield or a bomb that you can use for a limited time or until you die. This is a great game, and this was remade for the Wii, and I will get to that in a future episode. Streets of Rage was even ported to the system, in the UK. Unfortunately, it didn't come out in the US, but I guess I really can't blame Sega at the time. Anyway, it's a surprisingly good port. You can pick among the same three characters, but this time it's only a one-player game. That's okay, as Dave is my only friend and I don't like him anyway. I was really impressed at how they got each stage in here without changing them too much. I mean, there are changes, such as stage 6 having electric beams instead of hydraulic presses, but otherwise it's almost all here. This boss here is unique to this version, though. I don't know, I, I don't really like him. Since the Master System controller only has two buttons, you actually have to pause the console and then press a button to call in your car backup attack. Kind of breaks the flow, but it's there if you want it. You just gotta sit really close to the console. Yuzo Koshiro even did the music himself for this version. It's a pretty fun port, even if the stages do seem kind of long. Later that year, they also ported Streets of Rage 2 to the Master System. I don't think this one turned out quite as well. The graphics seem a lot more rough, and the control is really loose in this one. Yuzo did return to do the music though. Not a bad effort, but it could have been better. No Master System episode would be complete without Alex Kidd in Miracle World. This was Sega's attempt at a mascot style game similar to what Nintendo had going with Mario. Your primary weapon is your fist, and you break blocks to collect money and other things. There are shops to buy power-ups or even small vehicles you can use. At the end of some levels, you have to play rock, paper, scissors to advance to the next stage. A game of chance? Really? This shouldn't decide if I can progress to the next stage. The music is good, but the tunes are short and repeat on most levels. If you can look past these annoyances, the game is pretty enjoyable. It also became the built-in game on Master Systems in 1990. Alex Kidd in Shinobi World is my favorite Alex Kidd game on the Master System, or any system he was on. Originally this was supposed to be a parody of Shinobi, Sega decided to add Alex Kidd and I think it worked out great. The game plays very much like Shinobi, but adds a few things like the ability to swing around poles to launch yourself as a fireball and bounce off of walls, or even collect a power-up that turns you into a tornado. Controlling Alex is perfect. I had no problems playing this game. The music is great and it's all based on Shinobi. The only bad thing is that the game is pretty short. The game is starting to get rare, so you better find this one if you can. Whew. 
Yeah, we couldn't talk about every single Master System game there was, <laughs> oh, man. but we can take a look at some of the ones we missed in a section we like to call a montage. The montage where you can make your own opinions about the game showing, instead of us telling you what you should and shouldn't like. Yes, yeah, so let's get to it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Alright, Dave, so now what do you think about the Master System? The Master System, Joe, I like it. I actually really, really do like this system. It has Absolutely. some quality games on it. Yeah, it does. Really fun games. Yeah, and I, I love the hell out of it. I mean, I've owned the thing for what, like 26 years? Like I said, it was one of my, it was my first system, and it always has a special place mm -hmm. in my heart. And, you know, it's the one system that I really want to try to collect a 100% complete yeah. U.S. set. Yeah, or. that's going to be an awesome goal and should be attainable, and I will gladly help Give you out some of your games. Yeah, yes, at a you very have a reasonable price. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, thank you for watching GameSec. Let's go cause yeah. some trouble. Come on, man. <laughs> Let's go. Hey, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Come on, man. Come, Come on. on. <laughs> oh, looky what we have here. Oh, it's so great. You don't have any great games. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stupid Nintendo. <laughs> that was great. So great. Uh, yeah, great. great. What the hell was up to? Oh, celebrities! <laughs> oh, <my goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah!